Hello there, adventurers, and welcome to Walleye DM. If you are a player or a DM looking for additional activities that you can participate in during downtime, festivals, or holidays, well then grab your lance and your shield because we're going to talk about jousting. Now, I feel that jousting is underrepresented in D&D and Pathfinder. After all, these fantasy RPGs are loosely based off of medieval Europe, and jousting was very popular in medieval times. Now, when I used to play the basic Dungeons & Dragons system, I remember getting the green box or the companion set, and opening up to festivals and holidays, there were rules for jousting, sword fighting, and wrestling, in addition to other games that we could play for festivals and holidays. Now, after my players had done an entire dungeon crawl or just completed a quest, it was a lot of fun to just do a role-playing session that included festivals and holidays, and included in that were our jousting tournaments. So what I would like to do for you today is I have created my own rules for jousting in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. I'm going to introduce this to you and how you can play it. Now, you are more than welcome to check out these rules for yourself on my website. I will put a link below, and I will also put links to a few of the articles that help inspire me to create these rules. If you are a patron of the channel, I will put a PDF that you can download for your GM binder, and that can be found on Patreon. So I'd like to break this video down into two parts. Number one, we're going to talk about how to enter a joust and the rules of the joust. And then in the second part of the video, we're going to go over how to incorporate jousting into your world or into your ongoing campaign. So let's begin. How do you enter a joust? Well, there are three prerequisites. The first is to be proficient in animal handling. Now that makes sense, you're going to be riding and charging with a horse. The second, you must have proficiency in heavy armor, shields, and a lance. Now this prerequisite is to protect the rider or the knight that is participating in a joust, but it will kind of narrow the gap as to what characters can participate. It's primarily going to be paladins or fighters, but of course, if the characters know from first level and onwards that these are some of the rules and they're interested in jousting with their barbarian, then perhaps there are a few feats that they can take along the way. Way. And if you're really interested in having jousting in your campaign as a dungeon master, then perhaps there are some additional steps or things as far as giving these players additional feats that pertain to these abilities, as far as getting the lance and the heavy armor that they can do side quests for or do some downtime training. Now the third is to be of nobility or be sponsored by a noble or granted knighthood by a church, city, state, or a ruler of baron status or higher. So this allows for campaigning, for questing, and for role playing in order to be able to become a knight and be able to joust. Now the knights that are participating in a joust are going to be wearing the plate mail shield and lance and a well-trained horse giving them an armor class of 20. Of course there will probably be a few exceptions here and there. Now the lances are specially made with a blunt tip that is designed to shatter on impact and that is how we will get points in jousting and we'll go over those in here in just a little bit. And of course magic is absolutely forbidden. You're not allowed to have magical items or be under the influence of any kind of magical spells or or potions or things of that nature. And to really get the players invested into their characters as they begin their jousting career, make sure that they design or bring forth their own heraldry. And that is simply the colors and symbols that is used to identify the knight and that is usually shown on the knight's shield and or their lances. So the rules of the joust. Now joust is held in an arena called a tilt yard and this list is approximately 40 to 70 feet long. Now each rider are separated by a six foot high wooden barrier called the tilt. Now the way that jousting works is each mat match consists of three passes. Each contestant then begins on opposite ends of the field and charge their opponents while aiming their lance. The goal is to shatter your lance against an opponent's armor, primarily their shield. Attacks are made simultaneously with a roll to hit, and combatants may use their strength modifiers and proficiency bonus on their hit roll. And just as a reminder, there is no magical items that are allowed, so those aren't included in any type of two hit. Now, each pass is going to award the knights with points on how well they strike their opponent. Again, the goal is to strike the opponent's shield and shatter their lance. Now, for my jousting rules, I've based this on an average entry level of a level 9 fighter or a paladin. So, I am assuming that we have our strength maxed out all the way to 20 and a proficiency bonus of a plus 4. So, that would give us a plus 9 to hit. 
Now with that in mind, my examples today are going to take into fact these ninth level fighters or paladins and each character, so let's say we have a PC versus an NPC, they're going to add a plus nine to their roll. Again, that's plus five for strength and plus four for proficiency bonus. So with that, again, three passes and we roll our d20. So let's take a look at the results. If a character rolls a natural one, you miss your target and are unbalanced, you must now make a strength animal handling check with a DC 20 to stay on your horse. Falling off the horse will cause 1d6 bludgeoning damage from the fall and will award your opponent with a plus two for unseating. Now, if your adjusted result, again, we're taking into effect a ninth level fighter, so a plus nine. If that adjusted result is between a two and a 14, your lance will glance off of an opponent's armor. The lance does not break and you score zero points and no damage is dealt. Now, 15 to 19 on your adjusted roll, a lance hits the opponent's shield, but it does not break. You actually get one point for that. Now, if your adjusted roll is a 20 to 24, then your lance hits your opponent's shield and it breaks the tip of the lance. You get two points and that is going to deal 1d12 hit points of damage plus your strength modifier. Now, if your adjusted roll is a 25 or higher, your lance is going to hit its opponent's shield and shatter. You're going to get three points for shattering the lance. You're also going to deal 1d12 hit points of damage, and now your opponent must make a strength saving throw or be unseated. If the opponent falls off the horse, the striking knight receives an additional two points for a total of five points, and the knight takes 1d6 bludgeoning from the fall. Now, I know we are just hitting the shield with the lance, but I still like the idea of actually doing damage to the other person because I'm sure the jolts from the hits and their arm is going to be doing some damage. If you roll a natural 20, your lance is going to hit and the lance is going to shatter, giving you three points. Maximum damage is going to be dealt, so that'd be 1d12 plus your strength modifier, and the opponent must make a saving throw or be unseated. If the opponent falls off the horse, the striking knight will receive an additional two points for a total of five points, and the knight takes an additional 1d6 of bludgeoning from the fall. So again, we're doing three passes, and depending on your die roll is the amount of points that you can get. So in summary, you're going to get one point for hitting the shield, but it doesn't break the lance. You're going to get two points for hitting the shield and breaking the tip of the lance. You're going to get three points if you hit the shield and shatter the lance, and you're going to get an additional two points if a knight is unseated from their horse. So that is the mechanics of jousting with as far as how it's run with die rolls, but let's take a look at a few more things that are very very important as far as running jousting in your game. The first being at Knight's Cruise. So if one of the PCs in your game is participating in the joust, they're allowed to have a small crew as they are participating. The first and one of the most important is a bard. This is the character that is going to introduce to the knight to the crowd and you can have them role play this, giving their introduction of the knight that is about to participate in the joust. Now a bard can give one inspiration die per match. So that will give a little bit of a wild factor to the combat rules that we previously discussed. The next part of the crew is the groom, and the groom is one that takes care of the horse. The NPC or PC must be proficient in animal handling. The armorer is one that's going to tend to the knight's armor and must be proficient with smith's tools. So as a DM, you can actually have the armor take some dents, especially from some natural 20 hits or things of that nature, or if they fall off the horse, and perhaps your armorer is going to have to use its smith's tools to be able to fix the armor in time for the next bout. And then finally, a lance handler, valet, or a squire. This is someone that's going to hand and retrieve the lance to and from the knight, and this is going to require a strength score of 12 or higher as far as being able to hand up the lance to the knight before each bout begins. Now there are some ways to be disqualified from a joust and the number one way is by using magic. Magic is strictly prohibited in jousting events. Anyone found guilty of using magic weapons, armors, items, potions, or spells are going to be disqualified and maybe even subject to punishment. Now those that enter the list may be subject to a zone of true spell to agree with the terms of the tournament and or dispel magic aura or cleanse any possible benefits. Now aiming for the head of an opponent along with any other malicious attempts to cause serious harm is strictly forbidden. Jousting is a game of honor and integrity and so any writers found trying to do that or trying to seriously hurt someone will be disqualified and again subject to punishment. And then finally, I took this one from the movie A Knight's Tale. Any writer found not to be a noble or appointed by a noble, as previously stated, again will be disqualified and probably jailed or subject to other punishment. 
Now, some ideas for jousting etiquette that I had. Number one, a bard will introduce the knight, providing an inspiration die that can be used for that match. Number two, healing is not allowed until after the knight has been eliminated from the tournament. After a contestant loses their event, they may receive healing, and that's usually going to be provided by whoever's hosting the tournament, and then they can join the crowd to watch the remainder of the event. Number three, dying in an event is frowned upon. If a character falls below 20% of their maximum hit points, they are encouraged to withdraw from the joust. Next up, a rider can hold up their hand and shout the word hold in order to pause an event. This is only done if there's something wrong or something is unsafe with the current bout. And then finally, a rider can remove their helmet and trot down the tilt, signifying a withdrawal from the event. So those are the rules and etiquette that I have created for jousting in 5th edition. Now, if you are a player watching this video and are super excited about having your character participate in joust, then be sure to share this video with your dungeon master. Now, if you're a DM and want to include jousting in your world, I would begin at first level. There's no better time than session one to make sure that the characters know that jousting is within their world. In fact, you could introduce all of the characters instead of in a tavern, you could introduce them in a jousting arena. Perhaps the bard that's going to be a part of the party is doing his last introduction for a retiring knight. Maybe a cleric is giving healing to those that have exited the joust, and maybe the rogue is trying to pickpocket a few people and accidentally picks pockets the a noble or a knight that is watching the event. However you want to do it, including jousting from session one is a good way to get your players invested. Now, if you do plan on holding jousting tournaments, I highly suggest a single elimination eight player joust. Make sure if you only have one PC participating that the first NPC they square off against is of equal or lesser level, and then perhaps someone a little bit harder. And then of course, the third match, the championship bout is going to be the hardest one for them to win. Now, with all that in mind, most jousting tournaments are going to include very high level fighters and paladins and jousters or knights, and those are going to begin at night level. So if your characters want to joust at an earlier level, let's say some of the beginning levels, I would highly suggest maybe incorporating like a beginner circuit or an amateur circuit. And as they begin to win through these, then they can continue on and eventually hit the main list or the pro circuit. That's all I have for you today. What did you think of the video and my rules for jousting? Is this something that you could incorporate into your game? And if so, is there anything that you would do differently? Thank you very much for watching and on to the next.